Hello, welcome to the first episode of Two Wheeled Talks. My name is Reese, and today I'm going to take you through my experiences of getting my Category A motorcycle license. I completed my test around three months ago, so this is all fairly fresh in my mind, and hopefully I can share some of my experiences with you. If you find this video beneficial, please like and subscribe to my channel, and uh, you'll be notified when more content comes out. So I'd like to start with why I actually got into riding a motorbike initially. Um, everybody has their own reasons. Uh, my, mine is chiefly because I wanted to be able to get to work in what I perceived as a safer manner than cycling. Now, every day when you're out cycling, you're battling the traffic, you have cars overtaking you, close passes, buses, lorries pulling in on you, and it's an absolute minefield, especially when you're in city centre streets where the general speed is only around 30 miles an hour, but you are cycling around 15 to 20. All of a sudden, you become a huge inconvenience to all the car drivers. So this is where riding a motorbike actually appealed to me. You can actually keep up with all the traffic going along. You can make way through traffic as well by filtering. So I was able to still get into work in very good time as opposed to taking public transport or driving in and paying for parking. Um, and I felt the risks of going in every day were actually reduced quite significantly. Now don't get me wrong, there is always significant risk to riding a mo motorcycle and chance are if you come off it's going to be a lot more serious than if you are riding a bicycle. But from my own personal experience I've had a lot more close calls on a bicycle with other cars than I have out riding my motorbike. So touch wood, it all stays good. So this actually brings us nicely into how you go about getting that motorbike license. So it all starts off by applying online via the NDLS website to book a theory test at a centre near you. Um, personally I did a centre quite far away from me, but that was just down to availability. But it also meant for a nice day out and exploring a town that I've not been to just yet. So your theory test will actually comprise of 40 questions. Now there's plenty of apps online you can download from the App Store which give you all the questions that you'll need to know. Happy days, we've gone ahead, we've done our theory test, and now we can actually apply for our learner permit. So once again, you have to go online, and um, the RSA have got a new website out which allows you to manage all of your licensing activities, and you can apply for your license there. You apply for your learner permit in the category you want to get your license in. Um, because I'm over 24, I was able to do the direct access, and I applied for a category A license. However, if you're not yet 24, but you do wish to go for your category A, you need to be at least 20 years old with progressive access. Now, when you're 18, you can actually apply for your A2 license, but those are motorcycles rated not exceeding 35 kilowatts in a power to weight ratio, and not exceeding 0.2 kilowatts per kilograms, and derive from a vehicle not more than double its power. So if you're 16 and you really want to get out on the roads, you've got to go for your category AM or your A1. Um, I see no reason why anybody would only go for an AM, so at a minimum, go for your A1. And then as you turn 18, you can then go for your A2. And then when you're 20, you can continue that progressive access to get your category A. However, in my case, as I said previously, I only went for the category A because I'm an old fart and I wanted to ride a big bike. Now, choosing an IPT instructor is actually quite a tricky task, as I found out. I was spending quite a while looking through different websites, trying to call different people, and it was, it was difficult. Um, and then knowing as well whether the instructor you're going for is an approved instructor or not. So the RSA actually have a list of motorcycle approved instructors on their website, and I'll put the link below. But when you get there, you contact people, and then you explain what license you're going for, and find out how much that they're charging. Typically, you could expect to pay between 500 and 600 euros for a full IPT. The IPT is generally conducted over two days. If you're doing your category AM or A1, you are required to do 16 hours of a combination of class lessons and riding lessons. And then if you're going for your category A2 or A, you need to do modules 1, 3 and 5, which again are a combination of class and riding skill lessons. And now you're actually out on your IBT. 
do your class lessons, which is the mandatory, I'd say, boring part because you're not riding a bike, but it's super educational and you have to pay attention because you do learn a lot about your bike, how to maintain your bike and safety aspects of the road. But uh, we're all looking forward to being able to get on the bike, twist the throttle and zip around a car park, weave in and out of a load of cones, and then when you're ready, your instructor will actually take you out to the main roads. You'll typically be linked up with a headset so they can communicate with you and keep you safe. But this is your first experience really of riding a bike out on the open roads. It, it's actually quite, it's quite a daunting experience if, if it's your first time. Um, and for me, I found it quite odd because I started off on a 125 and we were trying to go down an 80 km an hour road, which was pushing it for the bike. So uh, that, was, that was interesting trying to keep up to the right speeds. But overall, it should, it should be a good couple of days. Um, whether you do it in two consecutive days or you split out over uh, one day one week, one day another week. Either way, it's, it's, there's many ways to do it. So with any luck, you actually satisfactorily complete your IBT and you can now go out and get your own bike. So choosing a bike as well is a, is a big part of your motorcycle journey. You want to you choose a bike that's going to be right for you. You're going to be comfortable riding it. You're going to be confident on it. Um, you don't want to be buying any lemons, so make sure you pay attention to the history of a bike. Try checking out to see if there's been if there's any signs of any accidents. Um, if a bike's been smashed out, forks are snapped off and welded back together, that's not going to be a safe bike to ride. So in my case, I entered the bike market roughly knowing what I wanted. Um, I kind of wanted something in the 300 to 400 cc range, as I've never owned a motorbike before. And at the same time, I'm not a particularly big chap, so having a huge bike underneath me would have been quite difficult to deal with, especially when I haven't got the confidence and time in the saddle. So I found one with a relatively low seat height, which is uh, the BMW G310R. And yes, you can laugh because it's a bike that a lot of women will ride, but personally, I find it, it suits me perfectly. And it's great for city riding, which is what I've used it for over the last year and a half. It's easy to weave in and out of the traffic, it's quite lightweight, the central gravity is very low as well, and it's not overly powerful. Really, the only times I find that that bike is lacking in the power section is if I'm going on a dual carriageway or a motorway where you've really got to give it some beans to get it up to 70 miles an hour. But if you have gone for a Cat A license, there's nothing stopping you getting a 600cc bike. You can get yourself like a Yamaha Phaser or a Suzuki Bandit, which again are great popular first bikes. Um, but personally, I just felt that it would have been a bit too much go for what I wanted. And they are relatively heavy bikes when you compare it to the 310. So the best advice I can give you now, when you're in this period between having completed your IBT and before you do your actual test is just to practice as much as you can. Get out there, do all your U-turns, go to a supermarket car park when it's empty and just spend about an hour or two going around in circles at slow speed, practicing the U-turns as much as you can. Because those are really one area that you might fail in the test. I don't want to scare you, but if you're not confident at slow speed maneuvers, it's going to show and you will get marked down. Other areas I'd recommend practicing on are spending a lot of time at roundabouts and junctions and just generally anything where you find that hazards can pop up or if you've got any personal weaknesses. But now you've gone out and been practicing loads, um, you need to wait until six months has passed between getting your learner permit to being able to apply for your riding test. This is just almost like a clearance period to encourage you to have as much time as on the road as possible as a learner. Now, during all this time as a learner, you should have been wearing a yellow vest with a big L, red L on it. It looks stupid, but you do have to wear it. It's law. Um, personally, I find that better than rather than having to wear, place a red L on your bike um, like you do in the UK. So when you do go for your test, um, you find a test day, you get it booked in. Again, you can do all this via the RSA website online, which is super. And it's a very good website now. It's all recently been updated, so please check it out. One of my top tips is before you actually go in for your category A test is book yourself a couple of lessons with a qualified instructor. They'll follow you around while you ride. They'll uh, communicate with you, telling you what bits you need to sharpen up on uh, give you advice on how to ride better and ride safer. And that's the important thing here is that the examiners will be looking for the safe riding. And that is super important. 
The other benefit of booking a lesson is that if you don't actually have a Category A motorcycle, like I didn't, you get to then borrow their bike. So I was doing my pre-test lessons on a Suzuki Banda 600, which in all fairness is a great fun bike, but it does take a little bit of getting used to. So if you expect to be able to just grab any old bike and hop on that ready for your test, it might be detrimental to you without any practice beforehand. But overall, it shouldn't be too hard. Now, you head over towards the test center. When you arrive at the test center, just take a minute to calm the nerves and chill out a little bit. Um, go over your bike again, just make sure everything's looking good, make sure your tread depth is right and it's one millimeter deep across the whole tire, make sure there's no cuts or bulges in your tires, there's no bold spots or flat spots. Make sure your bike's in good condition. And just generally check for your fluid levels and your brakes, your oils, uh, make sure your chain has got the right amount of slack to it. And you've got the correct tire pressures, um, and then you should be good to go. So assuming everything is all good, you can go into the test center, um, and then the examiner will be there. Um, and they'll instruct you what to do. I was doing this during COVID lockdown, so we had crazy rig and walls of taking helmet off, putting masks on, sanitizing everything, and all of this stuff, but hopefully things can go back to normal. You don't have to do all of that. Now you'll be instructed to sit down and you'll be given a series of road signs in front of you and asked to point, asked to name what the road signs are. Um, and this again is just a general test of your, of your road knowledge. You'll be asked a few situational questions and hand signals. Um, again, I was doing it during COVID time, so I actually had to have an earpiece supplied by myself. The examiner would not accept a direct connection from the radio onto my headset intercom. That was a big no-no. Luckily, I had a set of headphones in my pocket as well. So you plug your headphones in, plug them into the microphone, and then you're good to go. You go out to the bike. And then he asks you all the show me, tell me questions about uh, safe tire tread depths. Um, fluid levels, how do you check this, how do you check that, um, providing you're fairly confident and understand your bike, you should be good for that. The next part of it was moving the bike off the stand and then wheeling it over to another stand. So this is where you lift your bike up, holding the brake, you take the kicks on the way, you do a full check around and then you move it forwards about 10 paces or so, then you stop the bike, put the stand down and hopefully it's all is good. Then it gives you a few more instructions and then you should be good to go. So your actual riding test will last for about 30 minutes. Um, you'll get your instructions in plenty of time. My best tip for this is you'll receive an instruction. When it's a directional instruction, you hear it, do a shoulder check, indicate, and then you can wait to make sure make your maneuver further down the line when you'll make another check. Don't get too nervous and just ride how you normally would. During my test, I was actually quite nervous, so I kept thinking that the examiner might not see my shoulder checks and lifesavers, so I ended up doing far more than you need to on the test, and uh, that was his feedback really for when we got back into the test centre. Luckily, the rest of the ride was actually pretty clean, and the examiner recognised this, that overall the ride was fairly good, so he was happy enough to give me a pass, which is great news. So the first thing I did was call my insurance company expecting a massive drop in premium for the year. But unfortunately, they had other ideas and only reduced the premium by 20 euros. But at least now you'll have a full license compared to instead of a learner permit. Um, hopefully in the future, insurance companies should be a bit kinder to you as well as your experience and time in the saddle grows. Now, my insurance actually dropped by two thirds from my first year as a learner to my second year as a learner. But maybe that's because I turned 30 and I moved house. So it's all these combinations uh, kind of speak to it. But I was just very surprised that going from a learner to a full license uh, made very, very little difference. Nonetheless, you can now get out on the motorways and you can carry a pillion passenger should you wish. So that opens up a lot more doors and opens up your prospect of riding longer distances, going touring around the country, uh, going touring abroad as well. And I, for one, certainly can't wait to get back over to my home country of Wales and ride around the Brecon Beacons as they are just some fantastic roads. I really 
enjoy driving them, but I'd love to get on a motorbike on them. So one day, watch this space, I'll uh, do a vlog of riding through Wales. More to come on that. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Um, I've kind of just gone through a very brief summary of my experiences of getting a motorbike license. It's not difficult, I'd say, but it takes time. You've just got to be patient. You've got to stick with it, and you've got to be prepared to spend a bit of money. It, it's, it's not cheap, unfortunately. I hope you've enjoyed listening to me ramble on about how to get a license whilst on the back of my BMW G310R, which will be the main subject of the next video. Thank you for listening, stay safe and ride safe.